Where is Jen? I was supposed to meet Jen here at 9 o'clock, and it's 10 o'clock. Jennifer! Jennifer! Hello! This mountain and snow is crazy. I love it here. You're an hour late. I'm not late. You said 9 o'clock. Look, it's 9 o'clock. Try 10 o'clock. Jamie, your watch is still set on Mountain Standard Time. We moved into Pacific Standard Time over that last hill. What's with this crazy pack sack? This is my best invention yet! Jennifer, this is gonna totally change our Canadian adventures. And don't worry, I'm gonna build you one too. Great. It's a jetpack! A jetpack? Okay, Jamie, I think this snow has totally frozen your brain. No, Jen, you don't understand. This has turbo thrusters, okay? And I know what you're thinking, but it has all the safety precautions. So why don't you just stand over here a little bit and give me some space? Okay. Okay, over the mountains. Kids, we explore historical Rogers Pass through British Columbia's amazing Columbia Mountain Range. We run into 17-year-old Jeremy Waddell in Glacier National Park and learn about avalanche safety. Then I learn how to run a train down the rail at hair-splitting speed. Well, not exactly. In Jay's geology, I create my own avalanche in more ways than one. Big mountains, big dams, big Eddie, and Big adventures on this episode of CG Kids! You should have just left your jetpack on that mountain. That's it. I'm not making any more gadgets. Come on, you know you will. You know, we should have kept it. We could have used it in case, you know, we got lost and we needed smoke signals. <laughs> we are in an area of British Columbia known as the Columbia Mountain Range. Now, these mountains run alongside the more famous Rocky Mountains of Canada. We are traveling through the range's Selkirk Mountains following Rogers Pass. Rogers Pass is in the southeastern part of British Columbia, about 140 kilometers from the border with the province of Alberta. It's located within Glacier National Park, which has some of the highest occurrences of avalanches in the world. An avalanche here in the mountains during the winter usually involves a huge mass of snow or ice that suddenly loses its grip and falls from the mountainside down to the base of the mountain. Avalanches gain in size and speed as they travel, and they can bury people along with whole towns. And that's probably why the word avalanche comes from the French verb avaler, which means to swallow. Now we're here in Glacier National Park, which is home to the world's largest mobile avalanche control program. We're going to learn about avalanche safety when we hook up with 17-year-old Jeremy Weddle. <laughs> Jeremy said we were supposed to meet him by the green tree. The green tree? There's a lot of, There's green, a lot trees. of green trees around here. There's green trees out. Oh. Ah! Jeremy! <laughs> Hi. Hi! Nice to meet you! Nice to meet you too! What's you doing hiding in the snow? I was digging a snow pit! Hey, aren't you going to show us some avalanche safety? Yes, I am. But first, I'm going to introduce you to some people. First stop, meeting Big Eddie, an avalanche rescue dog, and his trainer and partner, Bob. Big Eddie has been trained to find people, human scent, buried underneath the snow. His job is to go and locate that victim using his nose. 
to find human scent. It's only one dog in how many that well, can become certified? One dog in about a thousand dogs. And this dog's uh, his mom and pa before and his grandfather and grandmother, they've all been search and rescue dogs. And they've, they've all, all had been good really schnozzes? Good, good noses, yes. <laughs> now to see Big Eddie in action. Jeremy is going to jump up and down in front of Big Eddie, get him excited, and then he's going to run away and he's going to disappear behind something. There's been an avalanche. You ready to go to work, Eddie? Search him! In BC and Alberta, there are 30 avalanche dogs. If a person is rescued within the first 15 minutes of being buried, they have a very good chance of survival. Search dog, yeah! 12 hours ago, you went out into this area and buried three things. They're, uh two sweaters, wool sweaters that were worn by somebody else, and one of my socks. I thought something smelled weird out here. <laughs> Good luck, my friend. Make your handler proud. We know you graduated at the top of the class. Let's see some action. A person can be buried up to three or four meters under the snow, and an avalanche rescue dog can pick up their scent. It's estimated that a dog's sense of smell is thousands of times more powerful than a human's. What's that you got there? Get it out of there! Come on, yeah, good boy! Why is it that dogs are so good at finding humans? I think it's because of always being around humans and being happy and, and really enthusiastic to come to people. They love right. their. They love people, and they they love people, love and they people. like they like playing. You love people, Big Eddie. Give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. Give Mama some sugar. Come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Next stop, the Avalanche Training Research Center in Glacier National Park. We journeyed up the side of the mountain in this funky-looking snowcat. Since we all couldn't fit in, Jeremy got some skiing in along the way. The amount of snow here is unbelievable, over three meters high. What's your job here? My job is to monitor the uh, snowpack. What I'm looking for is weak layers in the snowpack or weak bonds between two layers. And when I see that, then I know that that's a uh, place where an avalanche could start. Now we're going to do a shear test. What I'm going to do is cut a block of snow, put it on our tilt board, and see if we have any unstable layers. There we go. And there you can see there's an unstable layer. So about six inches under all of this snow, there's a good chance that it could all break off. Yeah, we'll measure and see how far that is. This layer is down about 17 centimeters. So Jeff, how does this affect an avalanche? Well, as you can see, there's uh, the two unstable layers are uh, places where the avalanche would start. The researchers also monitor the amount of snowfall. We have uh, 35 centimeters has fallen. The changing temperatures. And the next thing we're going to look at is the hydrothermograph. And the density of the snowfall. So that weighs 56.3 grams. We do avalanche forecasting for the people driving their cars through Rogers Pass. The Canadian Pacific Railroad goes through here as well, and the backcountry ski tours. As you're driving through the highway, you might see some tunnels for the cars to pass through, so the avalanches go over the road. As an avid backcountry skier, Jeremy always makes sure he's properly equipped. There are three main pieces of equipment you need to take. We'll start out with the most important one, which is your peeps or your beacon. This is a, a, a basic peeps. It goes on you on your lowest layer, layer. An avalanche can rip your clothes off if you're going really fast in it. So it goes on your lowest layer and it gives off beeps. And the louder the beep, the closer you are to the person. When you locate someone with the beacon, you pull out the probe, then you you probe into the ground. <laughs> until you find the per until you feel something. Ow, ow. And then uh, you, you, you can feel a resistance from a person like that. Ow, oh. ow. Or, or the ground. <laughs> you, you can tell when you hit a, uh, hit a person. And in that case, you leave the probe in the snow and you dig around the pole to the person. The next most important piece of gear would be your shovel. This is how you dig your buddies out when they get the gear. Right? We have traction because Jeremy put this sticky stuff called climbing skins on the bottom of our skis. That 
is so fun. It's like almost like snowshoeing for half of it and skiing for the other part. Oh, it's pretty cold out here in BC. Yeah, it's a little brisk today. <laughs> it's nice finally being by the fire. Oh, yeah, that's nice. That's very nice. Yeah, yeah. Eldon, this is Jeremy. Jeremy, this is Eldon. Well, I am enchanted nice to, meet to meet you, young man. I'm, I'm enchanted to meet you too, Eldon. Hey, excuse me. Did you get that cocoa and cookies for my two fine friends here? Thank you. <laughs> Eldon, what's gotten into you? I've never seen you be so nice. Yes, well, I've kind of decided to change my ways. See, I'm going to be a nice guy. See, usually he's kind of cranky. Oh, really? Couldn't, couldn't tell. It seems... Yeah, well, you know, know, sometimes. Just sometimes, but no more. No more. This is so nice. We can actually have a normal conversation. Yes. That's right. Wow. Gets pretty boring, huh? With nothing to talk about. What are you gonna do now? Come on, what are we just sitting here? I'm just trying to enjoy the fire of my hot chocolate. Yeah, well, what about you, hippie? Come on, why don't you say something? Okay, <laughs> I knew it couldn't last. What are you talking about? I'm a nice guy. I try. All right, guys, it's that time again. Time for a snack. Huh. It's not time for a snack. It's triviography time. And the question is, what is ablation? Ablation? And it's not one of those little things you get on your face from eating too much candy. A blemish? And it's not a freaky bodiless spirit. Apparition? There you go. Don't get duped waiting for the answer. Okay, give it back. I'll take that back now. <laughs> Jennifer, okay. When Canada was linking itself together by railway, Revelstoke was where the West Railway Line met with the East Railway Line. Completing the construction of Canada's transcontinental railway, the Canadian Pacific Railway. The town of Revelstoke is about 72 kilometers west of Rogers Pass and is the closest community to Rogers Pass. This small mountain city has a big reputation of having united Canada coast to coast. Four years after Major A.B. Rogers figured out how to get up and through the mountains, the last iron spike was driven into the railway just south of here in 1885. The idea of building a railway across Canada was actually considered as early as 1863, but in 1871, British Columbia said that they would only join Canada's confederation if they were linked to the east by railway. The Revelstoke Railway Museum was built here in 1993. What was it like building the railways in this part of Canada? Well, the mountains caused a lot of problems. They had to blast the rock away to, to tunnel through the mountains uh, with dynamite. They had to build wooden trestles over deep valleys, and they had to build snow sheds out of wood for, to prevent avalanches from hitting the trains. How would they bore through the mountains? Well, first of all, they would have drilled a, a smaller hole, and then they would have taken sticks of dynamite and packed the holes with the dynamite, which was attached to a very long fuse, and hide. All of the workers would hide, and they would light the fuse and wait as the fire burnt and exploded Boom. the dynamite. So, Jim, what am I sitting in here? You're sitting in a simulator cab, and uh, this simulator was set up in here to allow wannabe engineers to run a train. All aboard! <laughs> And your train is rolling. Now open your throttle to uh, and watch your speedometer up there. There she goes. You're starting to pull, and your track is starting to. Now open her up. Give it another shot. There you go. Jim, what's it like being an engineer of a train? 
Well, being an engineer of a train is a pretty responsible position. You've got to remember, it's not like a car that you go along and you slam the brake and you can stop in a reasonable distance. You take a train going down a grade like this, if it ever got away on you, you'd never get it stopped. Now I'm going way too fast. Oh, way, way too fast. And I realize that. Yeah. yeah, if you were going like that in real life, you'd have had a wreck here about four miles back. This is a steam locomotive that was built in 1948. It burns bunker C oil, and it used to burn about 16 gallons per mile. There was two men operated this locomotive. There was the engineer and the fireman. The engineer controlled the speed and the train. The fireman controlled the water, the fire, and the steam pressure so that the engineer could do his thing. I see you've got some pork and beans up there. What's well, with the pork and that, beans? That was our kitchen. No. That's where we heated our beans. A can of beans, uh, 20 to 25 minutes. A can of coffee, uh, about 30 minutes. You got 800 cubic feet of fire in that firebox, burning at about 2,200 degrees. Which would make the steam. Makes the steam, boils the water to make the steam. Which would cook the beans and make the train move. <laughs> cook the beans and make the train move. Yeah. All aboard! Thanks. <laughs> okay, here. Okay, guys, do you remember the triviography question? What is ablation? Ablation refers to the melting or vaporization of ice on a glacier. Kind of like my popsicle, I guess. Sorry. A glacier is a huge mass of ice that forms on the land. The way that a glacier moves across the land is often caused by ablation. As some of the ice gradually melts, this gives the glacier movement. Glacier National Park has more than 400 glaciers due to its altitude and tough terrain. We are standing on the shores of an amazing river in British Columbia, the Columbia River. Now years before there are roads and railways built through this province, this river was a major transportation route. The Columbia River is a very powerful river carving out incredibly deep gorges. And I like gorges, because they're gorgeous. <laughs> the Columbia River is 2,000 kilometers long, running through Canada and into the United States of America. Of this, 801 kilometers are in Canada. The Columbia River in British Columbia has three dams. Now two of these dams not only regulate the flow of water, but they also help generate hydroelectricity for the province of BC. And we are gonna check out one of these dams, the Revelstoke Dam, which is one of the highest and largest concrete dams in all of Canada. We're on the dam. I knew that. What is a dam? Well, a dam is a, a barrier in the river that stops the flow of water, and we store the water behind the dam, and it's used for flood control, hydroelectricity, irrigation. When did you build this dam? This dam was completed in 1984. It uh, took seven years to build. This is 175 meters. It's the second highest concrete dam in Canada. And is it true that this dam is bigger than the pyramids in Egypt, some of the pyramids? Yes, yes. It's larger than a pyramid in Egypt. That's big. These long tubes are called penstocks, and they bring the water from the reservoir into the dam's powerhouse. This water then passes through turbines at up to 420 cubic meters a second. When the water turns the turbines, they rotate generators, which generate electricity. Then the electricity is carried through cables to wherever it's needed. You wouldn't uh, want to plug in your TV set to a 500,000 volt plug-in, right? Why? What would well, happen? Well, it would blow up. <laughs> <laughs> single snowflake. Pretty harmless looking, right? Well, wrong. When it gets together with a million of its friends, it can sometimes turn into a deadly avalanche. So what makes this turn into this? 
Let's find out. There are a lot of factors that influence how and when an avalanche will strike. Some of them have nothing to do with snow at all. Let's start in the summer before there's snow around. The ground beneath the snow can say a lot about where an avalanche will happen. If the ground is smooth and free of obstructions, avalanches are more likely to occur because there's less for the snow to be anchored to, like this plastic wrap. But many mountainsides have slightly rough terrain, like this cheesecloth, or trees and rocks that give the snow something to hold onto. This can help prevent avalanches, but not always. If an area only has a few rocks, they can become completely buried by snow. So different conditions already exist when the snow starts in winter. A snowpack builds up as layers of snow accumulate with each new snowfall. Different kinds of snow will make different kinds of layers. An early winter snowfall might leave a light layer of snow, like this sugar. These snow crystals aren't very strong and don't stick together well. Then winter picks up steam and a big storm dumps snow on the mountainside. Wind comes and blows the snow around. This breaks up the top snow crystals into smaller particles that do stick together well, and this forms a dense layer. Then suddenly, another cold snap and some light snowfalls, making yet another layer. This cycle repeats over the winter, as gradually more layers of snow accumulate. But since the layers are not all the same, this is where the danger lies. When a stronger layer lies on top of a weaker layer, huge slab avalanches can occur. Snow breaks off in a single plate and goes crashing down a mountain. What contributes to many avalanches is mountain slopes steeper than 25 degrees. Let's use this protractor to measure the angle as I raise the board. Most avalanches occur on slopes between 35 and 45 degrees. Let's see what happens. Here the snow on the plastic wrap and the slightly rocky area came crashing down. But the avalanche on the rough cheesecloth and on our rocky and tree-covered terrain barely occurred. Knowing the terrain helps avalanche experts to predict when and where an avalanche might happen. With things like precipitation, wind and temperature, avalanches can be pretty unpredictable. A fantastic fact about the Revelstoke area of BC is that when Donald Smith, a CPR representative, hammered the final spike into the transcontinental railway, he actually hit it wrong and bent the spike. Although he was successful with the second spike, he kept the bent one. Legend has it he adorned the spike with jewels and gave it to his wife as a gift. It'll be all downhill. Oh, I just wish my jetpack hadn't conked out. You know, I wouldn't feel too bad about that jetpack stuff, Jamie. They're very hard things to build. <laughs> hey, is, is that Eldon over there with your jetpack? Whoever built this has no idea how to build a jetpack. What's he doing? There, one more screw and we're done. See you on the other side, yeah! Do you remember what they said in avalanche training? Yeah. Run! <laughs> Rip my snow pants.